everyone. My name is Carmen Mazera. I serve as Executive Director of the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. We bring together the community of graduate schools around the world that specialize in teaching international affairs. And among the different aspects of our work is to help connect students with opportunities and information, as well as staff at our member schools and affiliated schools to make sure that you all are aware of as many different ways that you can move forward with your APSIA degree as possible. We're delighted to be joined today by Aisha Mitchell from the Global Health Corps, and I will let her walk through what the fellowship is and what the different opportunities are with GHC. As we go through the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in that chat box that you see in the right-hand side, and we'll take all of those at the end. If you have any technical issues, please feel free to reach out to me through the chat function also in that menu on the right-hand side. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Aisha. Great, thank you, uh, Carmen. Uh, I appreciate you having me uh, able to share a little bit about Global Health Corps and everyone who uh, has joined. Um, as Carmen mentioned, my name is Aisha Mitchell, um, and I am with Global Health Corps. I'm based in New York City in the United States. Um, and I'm excited to chat today just a little bit about um, what we do, but um, a lot about why we do the work that we do and why it's important um, talking a little bit about our uh, leadership model and sort of our approach to leadership, and then um, we'll share a little bit with you about um, our fellowship um, and can answer any other questions um, that folks have. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, at GHC, we are all bound by the belief that health is a human right. Um, and this is actually written in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, but it's rarely reflected in our world. Uh, we have the money, we have the technology, we have the medicines, and yet people are still dying at alarming rates from treatable and preventable causes. Um, and what we're seeing is furthermore, these marginalized communities are disproportionately affected um, by these inequities. So if you look at the United States, um, the U.S. spends a little over $10,000 per person each year on health care, but we have the highest maternal mortality rate of any developed country. Um, and actually, that number is, is steadily rising as we speak, um, while, the rest of, while the rest of the developed world's numbers are, are declining. Um, and here in New York City, where I'm based, um, black mothers are actually dying at 12 times the rate of white mothers. Um, and what we're seeing is the high disproportionate rate at which black women are dying is actually the reason why the U.S. has the highest maternal mortality rate um, of any developed country in the first place. So, you know, we, we know the problem, we have the solution, but the necessary interventions aren't getting to the right people in the time that they need that. Um, and so what we're, what we're working within is a broken system, um, and Global Health Corps is uh, infusing that system with human-centered innovators, problem solvers um, across disciplines, across skill sets, and across cultural lines of difference, um, because we know it takes all of us to truly move the needle. Um, so before I get into kind of what a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of what we do. I want to um, talk about why, you know, our approach is unique and what sort of makes us unique. Um, so one, we believe in the power of collaboration and owning your own voice. So our fellowship, which I'm going to talk to you about in a little bit, operates based on a co-fellow model, um, which means that um, the fellows that we have are placed at partner organizations in pairs one national fellow, um, which is a citizen of the country that they are placed in, and one international fellow, someone who is not from that country. This model is integral to the connections that we are building across lines of difference, and it underscores the importance of collaboratively solving challenges um, um, 
and we truly believe that it takes all perspectives, backgrounds, and experiences to be able to actually create long-term sustainable change. Um, we are a leadership development organization, and so you know, I've shared a little bit about the problem, and our public health intervention is people. So we work to invest in developing emerging leaders to help them succeed and work towards the change. So we offer um, continuous leadership development training, one-on-one um, -on -one coaching. Um, we share other tools and resources um, throughout the fellowship and beyond, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, we're talking about what it's like to work in broken health systems. We are talk talking about um, using our voice authentically and what is our role in advocacy, um, understanding our power and our privilege, um, and also working um, to build and articulate our skills beyond the fellowship. We also bring in a lot of folks um, who are from the field and are external to GHC, since the former Minister of Health of Rwanda um, or the former U.S. Surgeon General um, of the U.S., Dr. Vivek Murthy. Um, and then beyond that, we are building a network and we're building a community and that leadership development doesn't stop after the fellowship. So we continue to invest in our McKinsey, for instance, um, a strategic consulting firm to offer free courses to our alumni. We are organizing and leading regional leadership summits advocacy trainings, and other opportunities to build community. Um, and we're also looking for ways to um, raise the voices of folks in our community, especially those that aren't typically heard. So we know that in order to build a movement for health equity, we first have to build a strong global community um, that's connected both personally and professionally. Um, so I just wanted to talk really briefly about sort of our leadership approach uh, as a leadership development organization and our model um, and it has four main components. Um, you know, I personally believe that we are already what the world needs, and so, sometimes we don't necessarily need more research or more findings, us to step into those leadership um, roles to be able to start chipping away at the problems that we're seeing. So, you know, first and foremost, it starts with self. Um, authentic leadership. What do you know? What do you not know? What do you stand for? And how how are you intentionally make decisions that align with those core values? Um, we also know that leading without an awareness or knowledge of your of um, your relation to others is not necessarily true leadership. I think it's integral to not only understand your relation to your peers, but also to those communities um, that you're not a part of as well. Um, we also talk about design um, as a strategy um, and process to inclusively problem solve, innovate, and think differently about approaches to challenges. And lastly, um, you know, we believe that it is extremely important to think um, about our world on a systems level and not just on an individual level, um, on an organizational level, on a community level, but really think um, broadly about what systems um, that we are a part of, what systems we, um, may we be subconsciously perpetuating and upholding, um, and why are uh, things the way they are. What is our model um, as an organization in terms of the fellowship that we offer? So number one, we identify the gaps in the field. Um, our model is demand-driven, so every year we are assessing um, where the needs are with partner organizations that are on the front lines of health to determine where they see um, these gaps in their organization and, and at the field in the field at large. Um, then, of course, we competitively recruit and select emerging leaders. So we are intentional about targeting the right leaders to join the global health core community both from a, um, a skills fit, but also a community fit. Um, and I'll talk a little bit um, more about sort of what that community fit looks like. In it. Um, and then lastly, we, we want to accelerate their leadership. So we provide um, intentional leadership development training. We build our leadership development curriculum in-house, as well as bring in other folks external to GHC. Um, we give our fellows field experience and, and a global network. 
Um, so we recruit and select um, around 140 each year from different cultural and professional backgrounds and place them with partner organizations. So those are specifically nonprofit organizations and government agencies. Um, here where I am based in the United States, specifically in New York City, uh, in Newark, New Jersey, um, in Boston, Massachusetts, and in Washington, DC. And we also uh, work in East and Southern Africa, uh, specifically in Malawi, Rwanda, Uganda, um, and Zambia. And we partner with organizations all sizes across issue area, um, from the Ministry of Health in Rwanda to um, the Children's Health Fund in New York City, uh, to the Art and Global Health Center in Malawi. Um, so the fellowship that we offer is a 13-month opportunity for emerging leaders ages 21 to 30. And fellows must be fluent in English and have a bachelor's degree and meet that age requirement in order to be um, eligible to apply. And fellows receive a stipend according to the cost of living where they're placed. And we also cover um, housing as well as the travel to and from all of our trainings and retreats that we provide. Um, so this next year's fellowship, the 2019-2020 fellowship, will begin in June 2019 and run through July 2020. Um, fellows will come together in the United States to begin their fellowship with a two-week training institute. Um, and then they're together um, another three times quarterly as a country and also regional cohorts. Um, and then they finish their time uh, in July as a full fellowship cohort the way they began um, in Tanzania at our uh, end of year retreat. Apply up to three roles, uh, two up to three roles um, in over 20 different role functions. Role functions span from communications to policy, monitoring and evaluation, data analytics, design and architecture, business development. Roles. Um, I would encourage you to check out our website um, to see a full list of last year's roles, and those roles will change um, when our applications open on December 5th. Um, but that will be a really good way to kind of get a sense of the types of roles more broadly. Um, we also have an application preview up on our website right now, which details exactly what you will see on the application. And so if you are interested in the fellowship, it would be um, great to kind of start looking at that and prepping um, for answering some of the questions that we'll ask on the application. Um, we also have a super robust and detailed FAQ section. A lot of the nuts and bolts and a lot of the logistics of the fellowship are covered there um, and a lot of other great resources. Um, I also want to point out that on our website, we also link to our blog, which is Amplify. Um, and it has a lot of great pieces written by folks in our community, um, in particular our fellows and our alums, about their experiences and their beliefs um, in and outside of the fellowship. And if for whatever reason you don't meet the eligibility requirements, we also have a page on our website with other opportunities to join the movement. Um, we see ourselves as a leadership development organization and we want to be in spaces that help folks think about who they are as leaders and how they can build a movement for equity regardless of it's through Global Health Corps um, or not. So, um, you know, beyond the basic age and education requirements, each role uh, does require and prefer or has um, required and preferred uh, skills and experiences. So when you are looking through roles, um, that is when you would see what beyond the minimum eligibility requirements you might need in order to be eligible for the particular role. Um, so beyond, you know, beyond the eligibility requirements, beyond a skill set fit, um, what are we looking for and what do we um, embody and strive to embody as a community? Um, so we believe, as I mentioned in the beginning um, of the presentation, that health is a human right. Um, and we um, have a passion for building that movement um, and 
um, for equity. Um, we are collaborative and we know that not only do we want to work across all lines of difference, but it's actually imperative to the work that we do. Health is so complex um, and we need various lenses and approaches to address challenges of inequity. And if you know we could have solved the challenges and those, I think we would have done it already. And so we definitely need um, more voices um, and working together to be able to do that. We're also super excited to use our stories and our experiences to compellingly engage others in the work of health equity. Um, so that might be spreading the word through social media or writing or just um, verbally, um, we are excited about inspiring and mobilizing others. Um, we also, in particular, um, in the context of the fellowship, really want folks who are able to pivot, um, who are able to problem solve and think outside the box. Um, this is really a, a long game effort um, and we're really in it for the long haul. And so we have to be solutions oriented and be able to adapt um, when things are not necessarily as we expected um, and not give up easily. Um, and then also this to me is, I think the most important in terms of the foundation for you being able to excel in any of the leadership practices or in general, um, just in life is being self-aware um, and being able to um, look at yourself and leadership on the journey. Um, no matter the age or the title, we are constantly learning about ourselves um, and about others. Um, and then at the end of the day, we are driven by impact. We want to make a difference both with our partner organizations, but also lar um, large, on a larger scale in terms of the movement for health equity. Um, and we want to do whatever it takes um, to get the job done. So, you know, in terms of the fellowship, it's a challenging year. Um, and we want folks who have grit, who have resilience, who are humble, um, and they're up for that challenge. They're open-minded and they're excited um, to wrestle with things um, and to really join a community of folks who take risks and who are passionate about um, making change and who are committed to the long game. So where are our past fellows? Um, what are they doing now? Um, you know, we are a community of nearly a thousand and we reside in uh, 42 countries. Um, our alums are program officers, they're policy analysts, they're writers, um, they're designers, CEOs, uh, data analysts, doctors, um, and so much more. And we, we know that um, there's not one path to changing a system um, and one path to developing as a leader. Um, and we know that the real strength um, of the work that we're doing is the uh, connectivity of our community. And that's really where the impact is. So when we have folks that are data analysts, we want them to be talking to the doctors. And when we have folks who are CEOs, we want them to be talking to policy analysts. Um, and so that is something that beyond just the work that our fellows are doing and our alums are doing, we are working to create community um, so that folks are, are further connected personally and professionally. And as you can see on the slide, um, a, the majority of our of our alums continue to work in um, either global health or social justice at large, um, and quite a few are already in um, mid or senior level leadership roles. And, and out of those folks, um, you know, are starting their own organizations, their own initiatives, and we know that that um, number will likely continue to grow. Um, and then in terms of, like I mentioned, the connectivity of our, uh, of our alums, we have about a third of folks who are um, finding out about their, um, through other alumni and, and um, Global Health Corps community members, which is really exciting. And we hope that that number will also grow. Um, so, you know, our alumni in terms of engagement are, are speaking at conferences, they're hosting panels, they're giving TED Talks. Um, we had uh, the UN General Assembly, as I'm sure most of you know, um, a few weeks ago in New York, and there was a huge contingency of alumni there, which is really exciting because they're not coming together as Global Health Corps alum. They're coming from 
their respective initiatives and their respective organizations and the work that they're all doing on one um, sort of initiative together, which I think is very cool. Um, and they also help recruit and select future fellows as well. Um, they speak at our retreats and our trainings for current fellows. Um, they participate in leadership summits and also lead 12 alumni chapters globally. Um, so they're all over the place and doing really great things. Um, so with that, um, I want to wrap up and share that we um, are actually hosting a Facebook Live event um, this Thursday um, at 11 a.m. Um, so you can hear from alums, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, by the way, um, and you can hear from a couple of alums and also a current fellow. Um, and we'll be taking questions live and they can answer from um, their perspectives uh, and experiences as well. So, uh, and I reiterated also in terms of when our uh, fellowship rules open, December 5th, 2018, um, and we will close our application on January 16th, um, 2019. So with that, I would love to, to uh, open it up for questions. Um, if we have some, um, Carmen, I don't know if you um, read them or um, I can kind of go through whatever works best. I'm happy to read them. Thank you so much for all of that background information. We had a little trouble with the sound, so could you repeat two quick things? One. Oh boy, okay. No, it's all good. How long is the fellowship? It is 13 months. Um, so you would begin, if you are applying for the 2019-2020 fellowship, you would begin your fellowship in June of 2019, and you would finish your fellowship in July of 2020. Great. And one other point of clarification. I have in my notes that the age range is 21 to 30. Is that correct? Yes. And are there any exceptions? That is correct. Um, we are intentionally We're losing you, unfortunately. So could you repeat that one more time? Yes. Can you hear me, Carmen? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, so, yes, that is correct that um, it is ages for ages 21 to 30. Um, and we don't make exceptions because um, our model is that we are um, trying to give emerging leaders um, leadership development tools and resources and field experience to enter in, into global health in a way that they might not have been able to do um, without that lack of experience. So it is intentional that these are folks that are um, just starting off in their careers. Okay. Um, you mentioned that fluency in English, I think, is required. Is there another language requirement, or does how does language play a role in placement? Yeah, great question. So in terms of the minimum eligibility for the fellowship, English is the only required language, um, but if you look at, there are um, specific roles that we have with our partner organizations, where in that role you may be engaging with communities that speak a different language, and it is never required that you have that additional language, but, but it's definitely strongly preferred in some of those roles where you would be working with um, that are speaking, say, French or Spanish or um, another language. But in terms of the minimum eligibility, it is only English. And, and that actually leads to another question that someone has, has raised. How much decision making do applicants or fellows have in where they're sent or what country they work in? And you said they could apply for up to three roles. How much? If they've applied yes. for three, do they choice do they have among those those options? Yes, that is a great question. Um, so, yes, it's, it's kind of twofold. One, um, you so there is a box that you can check on the application that says 
um, consider me for roles outside of the roles that I applied for. Um, the vast majority of people do um, check that box, but you can also not check that box. If you do not check that box, you will only be considered for the roles that you applied for. Um, if you do check that box, there is a possibility in terms of um, once you get once we get into rounds of selection that there may be other roles that we see you would be a great candidate for that we would love to interview you for. Um, and so it is all it all depends that that might be in addition to the role that you have applied for um, that might be instead of the role that you applied for. Um, so you kind of have a, a choice as to if you want to be considered beyond the roles that you applied for. Um, and if you don't, like I said, you will only be considered for the roles for those specific roles. So those three roles. And there is a it is a possibility that you are word in all three of those roles um, because the way it works is um, we are doing internal selection and then we're making recommendations to partners and our partner organizations do final interviews and select, um, they have the final say in, in selecting who their fellows are. Um, so you could be um, interviewing with partner organizations final round for multiple roles. And that actually is, is a good question. Once an application is submitted, what happens? Yes. <laughs> it goes into a black hole. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Very much just kidding. Um, <laughs> so um, once an application, we have five rounds of selection. Our first round is really just a minimum eligibility. Um, you know, is the application filled out? Um, do you meet the requirements? Um, and then, then our um, second and third rounds are really focused on um, skill set and qualifications for the actual role that you applied for. Um, and then uh, after that, we do a first round of interviews with Global Health Corps staff um, and alums. And that is for more community fit, so talking about your experiences, your commitment to social justice, um, it would be, it's more on the behavioral side in terms of questions, their interest in Global Health Corps, et cetera. And then um, if you, you make one or however many roles you are be, being considered for um, with the partner organization that you would be working with, um, and they will do uh, interviews and then select um, their final fellow from there. Um, and so that process um, is about four-ish months. Um, so April, May is when um, you know if you if you made it through the, all of those, you would know you're a finalist. Um, but we do communicate with, with all of our applicants at each round. So you'll know at each round if you've made, moved forward or not. And in terms of, of your ability to shape where you end up, do student, students clearly choose their roles, but can they weigh in on with what country, in what countries they're serving? And if yes. they interview for one role, can they say, oh, how about this other place? Um, so the way that it works logistically is when um, applicants go on the website um, and they will click fellowship roles on the drop down menu, they will be asked to put in their citizenship. Because of our co-fellow model, um, that is what our um, fellowship roles are based off of in terms of the national and the international fellowship positions, um, as I mentioned earlier. So once you put in your citizenship, all of the roles that you are eligible for will pop up. And then on the left side, you will be able to search by specific things. So you will be able to search by country. Um, you will be able to search by um, role function. So that's like communications or modern evaluation policy, et cetera. Um, you will be able to search, search by um, issue area. So maybe you're interested in HIV AIDS or maybe you're interested um, 
in maternal um, health. So you are able to kind of search and select based off of what you might be interested in. Um, but you, there is one application. You will, there, there are three drop downs for what roles do you want to apply to? And so basically it's just what role do you want to apply to? And then the essay supporting why you want want to apply to that role. Um, so in terms of applicants shaping where they want to go, um, applicants can definitely apply to, they might, so for instance, if you are a citizen of one of our African countries, um, you would be eligible to be a national fellow in what apply for a national role in those countries or an international role in the United States. Um, you can apply to a lot of different types of organizations. Um, and across issue area. Um, but once you say, I'm applying for these roles, those are the roles that you'll be considered for. Unless you check the box that says, I'd like to be considered for additional roles. And then you may, de you will likely, I will say, um, also be um, potentially reached out to about other roles that we think you would be a great fit for either in lieu of or additional, in addition to the one you applied to. And how much contact do fellows have with the local communities? Can they do things like on-the-ground language training and, and other immersion activities? Yes, I think that is a great question. Absolutely. Um, so something that we give our fellows is um, $600 US um, for professional development. Um, so this is in addition to whatever you're doing during the fellowship. Um, so fellows are definitely free to engage with, immerse themselves in the local community as much as possible. I know fellows have made um, really great relationships with um, some of their local um, co-workers or friends that they've gone to weddings and family events and, and all of that, um, but in terms also of immersing themselves in a more personal way, um, like a language training, for instance, we do provide $600 for each fellow to be able to um, have money to either go towards or cover um, something that they would like to um, experience or add to their um, sort of professional development toolkit. Great. And you, you've listed a variety of areas of, of health. One of our attendees was wondering if mental health is one of the areas that the fellowship can be can be done in. Yes, absolutely. And I would take a look um, at our roles. And again, like I said, um, the roles from last year are not necessarily going to be um, what organizations are doing what work in terms of mental health. So I would take a look at that this, um, this year before the roles open, but then certainly if you are interested in applying, you'd be able to see exactly what organizations and what roles are working in um, the area of mental health. And we have a lot of fellows um, that continue to work in those areas after the fellowship as well. In terms of having students be competitive candidates, do they have to have a medical or health background, or are you looking for, for something broader than that? Yes, great question. Um, applicants do 100% do not have to have any background, experience, study, area of study in health at all. Um, we have a lot of applicants who are not coming from the health sector if they're already working. Um, we have folks coming from the private sector, from consulting, from technology, from law, um, all different backgrounds. Um, it is not required that you have any health um, or education in health. Um, and you will see that reflected in our roles as well in terms of the types of role functions that we have. So we have folks, for instance, who might be interested in software development. We have roles that are um, that focus on supply chain. We have roles that are focused on um, data analytics, um, design and architecture, um, 
all different kinds of roles in terms of the discipline and the skill set and the background. Um, and I would say organizationally and as we continue to work with partner organizations, um, we, we will continue to move in the direction of um, minimizing as well the um, preferred background in, in health for some of our partners, but overarchingly, um, it is definitely not a requirement, and we w would welcome folks from different backgrounds to apply. About how many applications do you get for those 130, 140 spots? Yes, so we get a lot of applications. Um, last year, we got about 6,000 um, for 140 spots. Keep in mind that that doesn't mean that those 6,000 applications were qualified applications um, in terms of actually being considered, um, but we did get about 6,000 applications. I will say a caveat to that is that a lot of our fellows, um, at least a third of each fellowship has applied at least once before them getting in that time. Um, which I think is awesome because one, it shows that, um, you know, it's not, I think a lot of people might get deterred in terms of a competitive standpoint, and it's really a numbers issue, and that it's not always, I'm not qualified, it's just, oh, there isn't enough spots. And so I think that proves that if we have at least a third of our fellows that are applying again and getting in, that they are qualified, and it's just that um, in terms of the numbers and the roles, it didn't work out. And so I would highly encourage um, anyone who is interested in Global Health or um, in the fellowship to apply regardless of, um, you know, the acceptance rate. And if you don't get the fellowship to and you really want it, apply again. Um, because I think um, it is really important to... Um, also, I think those are the types of folks that we want in our community, for people who are willing to be vulnerable and put themselves out there and are resilient and are able to try and try again um, to go after something that they want. So I would definitely, even though we get a ton of applications, I would not let that deter you um, applying um, once or twice or however many times um, you want to. And you've mentioned a few things that help applications stand out, but it, if you wanted to be noticed among those 6,000, what are, what are good ways for students to show more abstract ideas like thinking outside the box or being solutions oriented? Are there particular things that really resonate with the review committee? Yes, that's a good question. I would say that there, we're not looking for um, specific experiences. Um, we, in terms of um, how you are articulating that, it's really, um, you know, I would say more along the fact that you have had experiences that clearly demonstrate that. So, for instance, if you're talking about um, being solutions oriented or thinking outside the box, <clears throat> that could be conveyed um, through a story that happened, um, you know, in an organization that you're a part of. It could be something personal that you have experienced that you are willing to share. It could be working um, with a group of individuals, um, you know, that are not like you on a project. Um, it could really manifest in a lot of different ways. And we, there's not one experience that is more advantageous that stands out to us uh, over another. It's really um, that you're articulating that you have these leadership practices like being solutions oriented and being able to adapt and innovate and being able to point to a specific way in which you've been able to do that. Um, so, and so it doesn't have to be global either, like, you know, it just because it could be, we, we also work, um, you know, here in the United States as well. And so, again, I wouldn't try to focus on what do they want to hear, but I would want to focus, I think it's really important to focus on what, what have I done, what have I experienced, what am I thinking about that aligns with 
what they, what they as in Global Health Corps is about and what our beliefs are um, and our leadership practices are and really reflect on what those experiences are and how you can articulate them. I would say the more specificity and detail to bring us into those, into those thought processes and how you're coming to decisions um, is going to be the most um, advantageous. A number of the folks joining us today are students. How flexible yes. are the starting and finishing dates, particularly if it if it involves you know graduating or something along those lines? Right. Absolutely. Yes. So our um, yes, we are not flexible in that um, our training institute start date is the start date that it is, like we, we are not able to move the training institute start date. However, it is very late in, like it is late in June and we have not had an issue ever with it conflicting with um, someone graduating. I cannot imagine that we would not take that to, into consideration in terms of, okay, well maybe you come, you're, you're not able to come you know, say the first day or something like that, but it is a requirement if you're going to do the fellowship to come for the duration of training institutes. Um, but like I said, I don't anticipate that being an issue in terms of date. Um, and it hasn't been an issue in the past, and we have a lot of fellows who are coming straight from school, either undergrad, either an undergraduate degree or a graduate degree. Wonderful, thank you. We have about 15 more minutes, so thank you for all of the great questions, everyone. Keep them coming in. I was wondering, I, were you a fellow? And if so, could you tell us about your experience? And if not, um, are there, there things that particularly help fellows navigate the 13 months? Did we lose you? My question was so riveting that she's got to think about it a lot. Let's see. Aisha, did we lose you? So you can hear me. Not sure why we can't hear you all of a sudden. Hmm. Everyone, I apologize. We're going to get her back just as fast as we can. I really appreciate all of your wonderful questions and participation in the webinar from lots of different parts of the globe. Let's see. Oh. Isha, can you give me one sound check? Well, I heard her. Let's see. Well, this webinar, hopefully with clear sound, will be saved in the APSI YouTube website where we have lots of other presentations. Um, and we have lots of other resources through the APSIA, which is APSIA.org website, in order to help you explore lots of different careers and options. We also have other fellowship information. Aisha said that if you all have other questions, she can easily type the replies and I can ever so happily read them. Um, so if you do have questions, please feel free to keep them coming in through the chat box and we'll get you responses until we can figure out the technical side of things in New York. I know that we have students signing in who are currently studying in France, who are studying all across the US, as well as some even from Australia. Good luck with that, and hopefully you're well caffeinated this late at night. I will happily take any other questions that we have for her, so please feel free to type them as is useful to you. And if not, we can, hap we can wrap up, and if there were things that you couldn't, didn't have a chance to ask. As you can see on your screen, there is a Facebook Live coming up specifically for the fellowship in just a few days. So, ah, I can hear you typing. 
Yes, Carmen, can you hear me? Hooray, welcome back. Sorry, I, have, I didn't touch anything, I swear. <laughs> I don't know what is happening, I'm so sorry. Not a problem. We were just, I was just doing um, a couple of questions, yeah. but I think you had some things you wanted to share. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say in response to your question, Carmen, I was not a fellow, um, unfortunately, <laughs> but um, yeah, in terms of things that could help um, fellows navigate their 13 month experience. So I would, I will say from the global health course that in addition to the leadership development training, we have um, country managers that oversee the programs and operations for each of our five countries in which we place fellows and that those we have a staff um, that are basically on call um, for fellows in terms of being their point of contact um, and helping them navigate um, various uh, challenges that they may be having. Um, we do a lot of sessions, quarterly trainings and retreats next week. We will have our quarter one retreat for the U.S. fellows, and we just had our quarter one retreats, our countries as well. Um, and we're talking about things like how to um, cultivate a healthy relationship with your supervisor. There may be challenges that you're facing. What are tools that we can give you? Um, we also do one-on-one -on -one coaching. And then we also work with an organization called RootWise, um, which was actually an organization started by folks who worked in the global health field on the ground and realized that there was a need to help working in global health sustain um, themselves because it is definitely complex and hard work. So they created an organization that actually works with people who are working in the field to help them think about themselves, to sustain their work, um, to reflect, and so we also have root-wise um, folks who are on call for fellows to be able to talk through any challenges or problems that they have. Everything is confidential um, that you share with them, um, and they are also present in all of our leadership trainings and retreats. Um, and then beyond global health, or I would say that in terms of like engaging with our alumni, um, we have a uh, community portal that is um, only for um, folks in our global health core community for fellows and alums. Every single fellow that has been through global health core is on the community portal and we have a community directory where you can look up and um, our alums are super excited to engage with fellows. They're constantly coming to our trainings and retreats. Um, and they have talked to applicants as well. We have all of our fellows listed on our website. So you can all even read about some folks of the people that seem interesting to you. You can look them up on LinkedIn. Um, but I would say that you have a wealth of resources and tools at your disposal to help you get through the actual 13 months, whether it's a challenge, whether it's sharing an excitement um, or anything in between, both from the Global Health Corps staff specifically, but also from the Global Health Corps community at large, including our fellows. That's great. So I think we're about ready to wrap up. I wanna thank everyone for joining us and thank you Aisha particularly for sharing all of your wisdom. I hope that students will take a great look at the yeah. fellowship when in advance and then be ready when the application opens December 5. And to my colleagues who are career services advisors and directors, perhaps uh, you'll have some great students in mind who couldn't join us that may be a good fit for the fellowship as well. So thank you so much to everyone. We were delighted to have you join us. And I look forward to seeing you at future APSIA webinars. Have a great rest of your day.